Flip Floss and Fly, presented by Say It Loud Canada, the ultimate financial literacy program, brought to you by the Black Business and Professional Association and the Donald Reed Estate. trailblazer and Roderick Brereton, social entrepreneur and conflict management specialist. Good morning, good morning. How good morning to you, brother. What are you doing today? Hoping all is well with you and yours. Thank you very much again for joining us on another edition of Flip Floss and Fly. We appreciate you. We value you. And we're going to have another stellar session today with lots of great questions, lots of great feedback. So bring it all. Tell a friend to tell a friend right now to join us and this Saturday and every other Saturday thereafter for Flip Floss and Fly. Farley Flex, Andre Smith. Yes, sir. Yeah. Say good morning, Farley. Yeah, I just want to say good morning to everyone. I want to commend all those who have jumped on this Zoom call. It's very, very important that you be a leader in your own life. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go through the process. You know, always think about how you can get that one baby step towards your destination, to the things you've aspired, you're aspiring to, right? We call it small steps, big moves. That's the way we move. Andre, how are you feeling today? Are you poetic or are you, uh, what, what's the status today? I'm feeling great. I'm actually very po poetic today. And I have a poem to share uh, with everyone. Uh, you guys ready? We're ready to roll. All right, awesome. So good morning again, everyone. I'm actually presenting from Kingston, Jamaica, believe it or not. I'm in Jamaica at the moment. And so that's why I feel the need to share a poem, you know, just because I'm here in my homeland and I'm great. Uh, so this poem is called Salute. And I actually wrote this poem uh, for the essential workers in the height of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, right? Here goes. Nurse, nurse, my condition I get worse. Nurse, nurse, what me I go do? Me can't breathe, I'm have a little youth with a teed. Doctor, doctor, pass me the PPE because this is a situation of rough and we not got what we need. In all my years of working, me never see a situation of going so long. Me leg them tired, me want to rest my head. But be, look there, a beer people are dead. Doctor, doctor, this worse than fracture. As Kaffi say, it coming like a rapture. Mr. President, it's about time you show your care for your resident. We're in this together. So it don't make no sense to stay in a parliament and argue with one another. PPE, PPE, everybody a cry. But it no matter because every second someone die. Doctor, doctor, we need to take a break because we know, because otherwise we can't go stay awake. Me no know about you know, but me salute the essential worker. Because without them, it would have been far, far worse. Uh. Nurse, nurse, you have my respect because you don't have nothing to do with the little money where you are make. All right, so that's called right. salute. There we go, there we right. go. A <laughs> little COVID relevance right there. COVID relevance, there you go. All right. All right. So before I actually start the presentation, you know, I was having a, a discussion uh, with a friend in Jamaica here. And um, what I, I actually said to her is, we're talking about uh, the, the whole concept of surviving versus living. And you know, I was telling her that most people are surviving and not living. And there is a difference between the two. And I'm actually gonna leave that thought uh, with everyone today to ask themselves whether or not we are surviving or we're living. You know what I mean? All you right, know, so. I just, just gonna say briefly, Andre, what we talked about the exact same thing about surviving versus thriving. Thriving, right. right. So living and thriving obviously would be synonymous in this case. Precisely. There you go. So again, for those who don't know me, presenter Andre Smith from Jamaica in Jamaica today, uh, graduate from York University and uh, the founder of Flip and Floss, which is financial literacy and investor program and future leaders obtaining sufficient skills. Uh, a 2020 CBC Community Champion recipient uh, because of my amazing work in the community, educating and empowering youth about financial literacy. And so today, 
we are actually going to be talking about a very interesting concept. It might be new to some, or some people might be expert, but nonetheless, we are going to have fun while doing it because that's what Flip and Floss is about, right? And so this week we're going up top like a boss, right? Welcome to week four, Flip Floss and Fly. Big up to all the people who actually are here for week four. You are great and you are actually in, uh, taking in knowledge that's going to benefit you in the long term. And I really applaud that. Andre, right, so I'm just going to turn, the turn my thing into slide. Huh? You're uh, put the screen on presentation. Yep. All there right. Thank you. All right. So this week, we're going to have a trivia again. All right. So we love those uh, trivia questions. So this week's trivia challenge from our previous session, please tell me what is compound interest. Also, have you ever earned compound interest? Who's going to be the winner of this week's trivia question? Compound interest. What is compound interest? So let's get on the chat and see who's saying what. Compound interest equals interest on top of interest. Have you ever earned compound interest, uh, Amanda? All right. And KG also shared what you should be getting versus what you're paying your credit cards. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. True. <laughs> Yes, I'm TFSA. Okay, great. And it, it goes back to what we, we talked about. So those who know the power of compound earns it. Those who don't know pays it, which is what KG is saying here about credit card. You know, before I move on, I, you know, I actually want to get some reaction from everyone. If you're feeling iry today, give me some thumbs up. Give me some iry in the chat, right? Yeah, because the presenter is in Jamaica and there's no way I can continue if everyone is not iry. All right. All right. Everybody. Here we go. We got some oh, Iron yeah. Man. We got, yeah. <laughs> All right. I Good remember stuff. if you can join us on video, we would love to see you to be seen and not heard. Absurd. And that actions speak louder than words. So if you can yeah. join us, we'd love to see you and know who's on the line with us um, each and every week. So if you can join and, us and to Roderick's point, folks, it's, it's very important to be prepared and ready for the things that come before you. You know, Flip Floss and Fly is an opportunity to network. And at the end of the day, with all the technology, we're visuals, we're a visual species. We like to see who we're interacting with, build, build rapport, build relationship, and so on and so forth. So I encourage you, when you know you want to participate in Flip Floss and Fly, get up that little extra 30 minutes early, get your Zoom face on, whatever it is you might be doing, right? And, um, and show yourself, show yourself so you can know yourself and we can get to know you. All right. All right, sounds good. Love the discussion so far. So again, so this week we're going to be talking about investment and banking fundamentals, right? Uh, you know, I've always heard this quote, patience is a virtue. And it's crazy because I think the first time in my life I fully understood this concept was when I had my son, right? And he was there uh, trashing everything and all over the place and you know, like I had to exercise a great deal of patience, you know, dealing with him. And I feel like that's the first time in my life that I've ever been uh, patient. But the second time that I've had to be patient is when I started investing in the stock market and I watched my portfolio or one of my particular investments fell uh, to about, um, by about 80% within like two days, right? It was a company that I believed in, but I watched it fall because of everything that was going, with, going on with coronavirus, right? And I was there and I was like in between uh, clicking the sell button so that I can recover at least a portion of my investment or waiting for some type of recovery. And you know what? About a week after that stock went up, <laughs> more than 100%, recovering the, the full amount of the loss and creating a profit. And if I had sold that investment, I'd be kicking myself like crazy, right? So those are the two times that I've had to exercise a great deal of uh, patience. And when we talk about investment, you'll see that time and patience um, will, is what really creates uh, wealth, right? We have some reaction here. 
what goes up must come down and vice versa. There you go, exactly, right? And that's, you'll see that in the investment world, you'll see the stock, stock price jumps all the way up and then it comes right back down or vice versa. Right. So uh, before I get into the discussion, so I actually have a, a disclaimer here for uh, this session. So uh, I'm going to just read it over for us briefly. Uh, this presentation is not and nothing in it should be construed as an offer, invitation or recommendation in respect of a company's credit, credit facilities or any of the company's securities or an offer, invitation or recommendation to sell or solicitation of an offer to buy the facilities or any of a company's securities in any jurisdiction. Neither this presentation nor anything in it shall form the basis of any contract or commitment. This presentation is not intended to be rel relied upon as advice to investors or potential investors and does not take into account the investment objectives, financial situation, or needs of any investor. All investors should consider such factors in consultation with a professional advisor of their choosing when deciding if an investment is appropriate. By participating in this session today, attendees agreed to indemnify and hold harmless Andre Smith, Flip and Floss, aka Flip and Floss, Easy Solution Facts and Consulting Services, and its partners of any and all liabilities or legal proceedings. All right. So serious money matter we're getting into today. So we have to protect ourselves. And we can't forget the BBPA. We're, uh, and the BBPA, <laughs> and the BBP, right? And Urban Res. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Carly Flex. We represent the Floss. <laughs> the Flip Floss and Fly. The floss All right. So we're going to, you know, today's uh, session is going to be a, a bit heavy. And it's going to be a, a lot of definition. And we're going to look at some stuff online. So feel free to chime in and ask any question you have, right? We are here for the discussion and no question is deemed ridiculous. So ask any question um, and ask as much as you can. So we're gonna start off by talking about what is a stock, which is one form of uh, investment, right? So a stock is an investment. When you purchase a company's stock, you are purchasing a small piece of that company called a share, right? So for example, you go to company ABC, which is a public company, and you bought one share in company ABC, you've bought a piece of that company, right? And it's essential to know that when you buy that stock or that share, that you are not an owner, right? So you can't just go in and dictate how the company should operate, right? But it gives you certain privileges, such as the ability to vote, right, on the board of directors if you bought like a voting share, um, or to vote on other company policies, right? So in the, in the, in, in the stock world, we're going to touch on uh, the two different classes. There are multiple classes, but overall, the two major classes when you're talking about a stock is what they call a common stock and a preferred stock, right? So a common stock allows you to own a portion of the company without taking possession, just like I said earlier. And this makes, gives you the ability to vote on issues right? And it gives you a piece of that company, right? Whereas a preferred stock, this entitles you uh, to fix dividend. Remember last week we spoke about dividend and dividend is a payout from profit. That's the corporation's way of saying, thank you for investing in our company, right? So it, the dividend works similar to an interest payment. You put in a certain amount, you buy a certain amount of stocks and the company pays you a dividend in return for your investment, right? And those payments are fixed. So what's the significance of uh, you know, a common stock versus a preferred stock? Now, preferred stock holder, they, as the name suggests, they, are, they have preference. So if anything should happen to the company, they are gonna be the first to get any payout, right? Because they have preferential treatment. Whereas the common stock holder would be the last, right? So if you look at the hierarchy, I believe it's um, debt holders and preferred and then common. Right? So you'd be the last, you take on more risk, but with more risk comes more reward. Right? So common stockholders tend to generate more income through capital gains. Right? And we also talked about capital gains last week, which is an, an increase in over what you paid. Okay? So let's give them one more example of capital gains so they remember. Sure. So, so an example would be, for, you know, let's say you bought a house today for 100,000 Canadian dollars, 
and let's say in about three years time, the house uh, is worth 150,000 Canadian. So when you sell that house, that 50,000, that the increase in value, that 50,000 will be considered capital gain, right? And capital gain, as the name suggests, only goes for uh, works, is, is only considered a capital gain for capital properties, right? So some form of capital property would be like, uh, um, you know, commercial real estate, uh, residential real estate stocks, right? So those are some type of uh, um, capital properties, all right? And I have a question here. What is the difference between a stock and a shareholder? I said it earlier, so if you're listening, you should be able to get this one. I feel like Amanda is going to be answering this question. Hold on. Any reaction? I want to give someone else a chance. All right. Sounds good. Is it possible to go? You know what we can do, Amanda, is that you could still offer your, your thought so that everyone learns from you. And then if someone comes with a different notion or positioning on it, we could give the, the prize to them. But your contribution is very, very much valued. So I wouldn't hold back. So somebody- Perfect. So somebody Kay Wellington yeah. here hey, yeah, says a uh, shareholder owned the stock. Correct. Right? So to become a shareholder, you will have to uh, buy stock in the company. And another question here from KG, is it possible to own a stock to so common plus preferred? Yes, it is possible. You can have both, right? If you want to take over a, a company and, you and your pocket is deep enough, all you have to do is buy 51% of the voting shares, right? And you can take over that company. So you'd effectively become the owner of that company, right? Uh, in, in Canada, uh, under the, the, the CRA tax rules, I believe anything 10% uh, or higher is considered significant influence, right? So if you buy 10% of, of the voting shares of a company, it means that it, you have a significant influence in that company. So you can almost influence some of the policies that the company will make, right? So good, I love it. All right. All right, so the other type of investment that we're gonna be talking about today is ETF. Anyone ever heard the concept ETF before? I've ever gone into the bank and the bank uh, talks about uh, an ETF or does anyone have uh, ETF? Is that an emergency task force? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> emergency task force, love it. I wanna definitely see them in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> They're needed during COVID-19. All right, so ETF is an exchange traded fund. And if you're familiar with uh, Warren Buffett, you'll hear him talk about ETFs a lot. So it's a, it's a type of security that involves a collection of securities such as stocks, right? So what that means is that you'll probably have uh, three, probably four, probably 10, the stocks of about 10 companies forming one to create an ETF. So one of the, the, the advantages or the goal of an ETF is to minimize your risk exposure. So when you buy the stock of one specific company, you are taking on more risk because it, you're, you're buying in that one company. But when you buy an ETF, you are minimizing your risk because you're investing in multiple companies. So if one company's stock is going down, the others might go up. So that kind of like offset um, the losses. So that's really what um, is the major difference between the ETF and the stock. Uh, uh, for, for, for new investors or for those who are uh, more risk averse, I generally uh, recommend uh, ETF over going into stock. Um, but you Andre, have to keep in mind. I, I was just huh? going to say a good example of that uh, that the young people would probably be able to relate to is the technology sector. Um, you, right. you have Google, Microsoft, Apple, et cetera, et cetera, all in one package, so to speak. Um, right. I know my son has done very well with that over the, over the years. Um, yeah. it, so that's a good understanding. So hypothetically, if one of those stocks, as you said, uh, suffers uh, a loss, the, the likelihood of all of them suffering a loss simultaneously is very low. It's very uh, low, right. So, so yeah, you always have that resilience to, to um, fluctuations in the marketplace. For a uh, great example would be during COVID, the technology stocks are doing extremely well. 
because yeah. people are spending more time online because they're working from home. Um, they're, they're buying online through online services, et cetera, et cetera. So all these yeah. companies that are providing those services in terms of internet accessibility, um, right. you know, et cetera, et cetera, e-commerce and things that are doing extremely well. Definitely. Definitely. I uh, love the, the, the summation of that. Um, so yeah, like, uh, and, and you know, like, it, and it, you can have a you can have a, a, a diverse mix. So you can have a combination of ETF or individual stocks, right? So uh, when you talk about uh, portfolio diversification, uh, which is what ETF try to um, to achieve, uh, you know, you can achieve that diversification by uh, buying into different sectors, different companies, right? Uh, you know, just like uh, Farley says, you know, during uh, COVID nineteen, there are some companies that are doing a lot better than others. Right. So, for example, the retail industry and the travel industry is suffering, but the tech, certain tech uh, stocks, they're prospering. Uh, they're doing very well. And, and the same for certain pharmaceutical companies, because uh, those companies are actively engaged in uh, trying to come up with uh, the cure or, or not the cure, the vaccine for COVID-19. So you'll find that there's a lot more uh, movement. And when we actually toward the end of the presentation, we start talking about the, the factors that affect share price then you'll understand why these prices may go up or go down, all right? Now, is that something people could buy in terms of um, when, when, when they're getting into stocks or is it something specific that you have to buy from a, a broker, like an ETF? So, um, yeah, you have the option. So actually, we're, we're, we're gonna talk about um, uh, the, diff, like, the types of like brokerage options. So there's self-direct, where you can do it on your own or you can go through a broker. Um, okay. But both options are available. So uh, you can go directly to the broker and you can say, this is the ETF that I want, or you can uh, try to find those ETFs and you can buy it by yourself. So okay. that's the, the beauty of like um, technology is that we have more options at our fingertips. Right, so quick um, question from somebody. What's the difference between ETF and a mutual fund? That's a good question. Um, that's a good question. I, I think they're 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 fairly uh, similar in my in, in my opinion. Uh, um, the the really difference is uh, I think it's it's just like the I think one what mutual fund is more of active management of the fund, um, and then there's you know there's a, also the management expense ratio component. Um, I believe with mutual fund it, it tends to have higher uh, management expense ratio, right? Uh, but they're, they're fairly similar. Um, they, they achieve the same thing, that portfolio uh, diversification. So someone, all right, so here KG says, uh, mutual funds attempt to beat the market, whereas ETF performs with the market, right? So yeah, and that, that's, that's great. Thanks KG, uh, because the ETF generally uh, matches the, the major indexes, right? So like the S&P 500, so if the rate of return on the S&P 500 is 10%, then you know that ETF will try to achieve that 10%. And just like uh, KG says here, mutual fund uh, try to outperform. Well, it's not always true that it outperforms. You know, sometimes those, ET those mutual funds are ETF, they'll decline in value. And you have to keep in mind when you're buying um, certain ETF and mutual fund, you have to keep into account uh, management expense ratio, right? Because um, you know, th this fee is charged on the principal. So whether or not uh, it goes up in value, you're going to be required to pay that, that fee, right? So that's one thing you want to keep in mind when you're doing um, ETF and mutual fund. You want to keep your costs low. I mean, it's the same thing with stocks. Um, the same thing with stocks is just that with self-direct investing now, you literally pay per trade. So when you buy, you pay a commission. And when you sell, you pay a commission. That's it. There's no more fee. Uh, involved uh, in the process. And so uh, KG is uh, bringing in some really good facts here. So KG is saying only 8% of mutual funds managers are truly profitable. So that's something that you definitely want to keep in mind because your ultimate goal is profitability. KG, you want to you want to chime in? You want to come over the mic for a second? And uh, you seem like you have some experience with mutual fund. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, is there a question that you wanted me to answer? <laughs> uh, have you have you had any direct exp, um, experience with a mutual fund? 
Um, I have not. I've had more experiences with RESPs, um, but okay. there are a lot of people compare RESPs to mutual funds. So I've gotten my uh, knowledge from that um, in regards to uh, mutual funds. Um, but th at the end of the day, uh, what I know is that um, the mutual fund managers, regardless if they're making you a profit or not, you're still paying out that MER fee, right? right. Um, versus an ETF, something that you can self perform and, and handle yourself. You're avoiding that fee and also you're controlling your money. Like you're, you're the one, you know, working hard for it. Uh, you're mm -hmm. obviously going to have more benefit. You're going to have more um, uh, like priority in regards to your money than a stranger. Right. Right. Andre, there's also a, there's also a different margin of error. So for instance, um, when, when a mutual fund manager is deciding how to allocate assets, for instance, that's mm -hmm. at his, his or her discretion um, mm -hmm. on your behalf. Whereas right, exactly. If it's an ETF, you're, you're going to, you, as you said earlier, it's more like trading stocks. Like you just right. what you what you think will increase, decrease. Will increase in value, right. Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but the, the autonomy that the mutual fund manager has is, is that they can say, okay, um, we're going to push more funds towards this, this, these particular um, right. companies or or services, or and you know that's why it's good to in the same concept as having um, ETFs within the mutual fund environment. You want to have a nice, nice diversified um, right. uh, portfolio so that that resilience is built into the diversity. It's built in, correct. Andre, uh, yes, yes something, Andre. Sure. Also remember, you know, it's, it's something I, I talk to all the time. Remember the business model on which the world is operating. It's a free market. It's a capitalist world. And one of the key ingredients of capitalism and the free market is giving you multiple choices. Right. You're trying to find products that satisfy every taste. And so it's the same thing with the EFTs and the mutual funds and the debts and the what have you. We call it diversification. But it's actually a legal agreement that specific users of the market to say, I prefer this or I prefer that. Right. They tend to serve the same purposes to give you a return on your investment. But some folks like high risk, some folks like low, some is average, some sometimes don't need risk. And these right. are just instruments that are provided to the market that basically serve users. the same purposes. You give right. them a dollar, you get like a dollar plus. Yeah, no, I agree. And, uh, and so that's why even when you're starting your investment journey, one of the first things you want to uh, uh, identify is what your risk tolerance is. Are you a risky investor? I know for me personally, I'm a very risky investor. Like right now, my, my portfolio um, is, in terms of like what's in my investment portfolio is 100% stock. And I'm talking about individual stocks. I don't have any ETFs, right? So you have to determine what your risk tolerance is. That's a very good point there and see which one of these products work for you. But you also want to know that when you're investing, you're essentially um, running a business, uh, quote unquote. So you're, you're there to make a profit and you also want to keep your fees low, which is why uh, you, are, you have to look for those mutual funds if you're going into mutual fund to see uh, which one is more profitable or which of those uh, mutual fund managers achieve their desired result and, they, and which of those mutual fund managers have the lowest um, MER, management expense ratio, right? You want to keep costs low and profit high. That's basic business 101 right there. All right? And, and guess what, Andre? Mm -hmm. The monies that are placed in these funds are for business people who require funds to, to enable their business or to scale their business. Yes. But as the free market allows, you can also make a living by assisting them. So right. the real reason for going on the stock market is because people need funds to create businesses. Right. That's an important point, Michael. But you can also invest there and make the money. Right. Yeah, that's a great point, Michael. Uh, oftentimes we don't talk about the relationship between the investor and the company. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, companies, when they decide to go public and they do their initial public offering, they, they often you know, the marketing of who they are, what they want to become, the potential of the, of the company, et cetera, et cetera. That's mm -hmm. their pitch to potential investors. A lot of people may not know this, but this happens. Um, uh, if it, anybody who's a football fan might remember a quarterback named John Elway back in my time. Um, 
And John Elway created a, uh, an exchange called Fantex where they traded actually athletes. And um, mm -hmm. what they would do is create an IPO, which is an initial public offering of $10 million invested by people. And the return on that investment was 10% of the athletes' earnings across all platforms, whether they bought you know, McDonald's franchises or got a big contract for a, a sporting, um, an endorsement contract or their salary, the investors mm -hmm. would get 10% back. But that's a relationship where sports right. fans get to invest in the athletes that bring them joy through watching right. the sport. So it's a really yeah. interesting dynamic um, right. that you don't necessarily see in, in, in business. Yeah, and, and thanks, Farley. I just, I just want to always interject those stuff because yeah, the reason important. for EFTs and for mutual funds and for stock is not what we think as we see. The underlying, the underlying economics is to do something, but, but free market allow you to also make a living from 100%. buying, day trading, and that sort of stuff. And I know you're going to talk about the stock exchange a little later and the, you know, how you price stocks and what it means by like going up and going down and how that translates into the real economy. Because mm -hmm. sometimes there's, there's, there's a big disconnect, like what's happening now right. with COVID. Yeah. Yeah. No? Yeah. Well, and, and I know I agree with you. And even right now, you, you know, one of the biggest drivers of the stock market right now is FOMO. Actually, anyone know what FOMO is? Let me see who knows what FOMO is. <laughs> I know everybody know YOLO, but let's see who knows FOMO. What's, what's Here that? You go. Trisha. <laughs> so Trisha that? got it. Fear of missing out. Okay. And so uh, that's a big thing that's driving the stock market now. And it's, it's really upsetting, like, um, a lot of businesses and uh, traditional seasoned investors, because a lot of people, uh, for example, they, you know, um, a company stock price might, might be rising rapidly, and there's a lot of Facebook and, and other social media groups out there where people um, share information about what's trending. And so once people see that a, that a stock is going up in value, everybody wants to jump on and ride the wave, as they would say, right? Um, and then those people um, who are not familiar with investing and uh, knowing how to decide which business to, uh, to invest in, they ended up carrying the bag, as they'll say, right? So, you know, carrying the bag is a situation where the stock price rises. Uh, you went in and buy, you bought the stock at a really high price, and then everyone starts selling off, and then you're left with the stock at that high price, right? So because of FOMO, a lot of people are losing money and carrying the bag, um, so that's a good point. And you know, I agree with uh, what Farley and what Michael said that the underlying purpose or the, the reason for um, you know, you know, the stock is to actually raise capital for businesses, right? And on that note, another way that a business rate raise capital is through the bond market, right? Yes. And so a bond is another type of a financial instrument of indebtedness, right? So indebtedness is really just a big fancy word for a company being in debt or somebody being in debt, right? So indebtedness of the bond issuer to holders, right? So the bond issuer would be the company. So the company is issuing the bond and the bond holders would be uh, the investors that are, um, you know, lending the company the money, right? So this is another way. And, you know, and why am I talking about all of this, right? The, the reason why I choose these things to bring up in these sessions is because I want people to understand, you know, yes, you know, corporations, it's, this is a way to raise money, but I also want people to understand that there are other ways that you can earn income, as we talked about last week. And I have carefully considered the flow of these presentations, right? So last week, we talked about uh, the sources of income. So if you are trying to generate additional income, these are additional sources, you know, stocks, ETF, mutual fund, and bond, right? So when you buy bonds or you buy debt in a company, the company agrees to pay you interest, right? And that interest uh, can be paid uh, monthly, quarterly, um, annually, whatever the agreement is with that company, right? So I want everyone to open their, uh, their minds and you know, realize that there are additional ways. And I, I know Canada um, has the Canada, um, the, gov the government savings bond, I think it's called Canada government Canada savings, savings bond. bond. Yes. Right, the Canada savings bond. So that's one option there to help the government to actually um, you know, invest back into to Canada and, you, you know, you get an annual, I believe it's an annual interest, right? So, and then, you know, there are different classes of bonds. So there's what they consider junk bond. Uh, and those bonds uh, tend to be a lot riskier and offers um, higher interest. So just like stocks, there are different types, 
right? So that's one thing you would want to look into if you're if you decide to go in the bond market, right? Yep. So here's well, another one of the key distinctions, Andre, is also with bonds. They usually have a term, so it could be a five-year bond, right. um, it could be fifteen-year bonds even. Yep. Um, so you just and that's very passive investing because you you put that money in, it sits there, and you know it's obviously got some risk because it depends what the value of it is at the at the outcome. But um, right. something you don't have to. A lot of people did that it, even prior to our ESPs. People were doing that at, for education purposes, so that if their child is, um, let's say, a, a, when they're born, literally, they'll calculate. Okay, let's let's invest in a bond that and we'll cash in on it when the child's ready to go to university for instance mm -hmm. right? you could do those kinds of analyses um as far as investing in bonds yes. and, and guess what guess what fernie um and i'm sorry andre uh, the bond is a technical term for the debt but yeah. it's used it's used mainly for long-term financing exactly mm -hmm. so people are in the long-term business as you just explained you want to invest for 20 years for your kids to go to college right you buy a bond and you then cash it at the end of 20 years so, so bond is more favored for long-term investment as against stocks and efts and mutual fund which are all today tomorrow kind of transactions and that's so, why it's important to have a diversified portfolio because some things I look for more short term, like if it's high risk, right. short turnaround, yes. bonds tend to be considered safer. You'll find a lot of, a lot of right. um, grandparents will buy a bond for their grandchild. You yes. know, it's, it's very safe and, and you don't yes. have to monitor it and so on. Yeah. And, so on. Yes. and I mean, that's a good point to note because with the bond, like it, it, it provides, like the, the terms are usually stated, right? So you can't go in and say, okay, I'm only investing in this bond for like one year. The, t the terms are stated. So you'd get the, the um, the minimum amount that you can invest, um, the interest and um, the 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 maturity, so things like that is stated. Whereas, uh, just like Michael said, with stock, um, it can be short term, it can be long term. So there's more flexibility over um, the time the time frame in which you want to hold. And when we actually talk about um, different investment strategies, you'll see that there are short term uh, investment strategies, there are long term investment strategies, and there are also investment strategies that are immediate today, right? Uh, so these are some of the things that you have to think about uh, when you're deciding uh, to invest, you know, your time frame. Uh, if you're investing in your child's education, um, you know, and that child is one, then perhaps, you're, you're, you know, you get something long term, right? Bonds might be suitable or it could, it could be stocks as well. You can find a company and invest for the long term or ETF. You have to decide how long you're planning to, yep, to invest. So we have a question in the chat. Can you explain again? Um, the difference between, or sorry, um, they're not too sure what indebtedness means in terms of the bonds. Could you just explain mm -hmm. that one more time? So, people sure. can... so just like Michael said, so bond is a, is a fancy term for debt, for the company uh, borrowing money, right? So indebtedness of the bond to the issue. So indebtedness is just saying that um, the company owes um, those people who give them money to purchase the bond. So for example, company ABC comes out and say, okay, I need to raise 10 million. And each person can buy a bond, which is a debt for $1,000. Yeah. So you put, as, a, as, a, as an investor, you give company ABC $1,000. So company ABC owes you $1,000, right? So that's what indebtedness really mean uh, in that scenario. Okay, great. Very good. I just wanted to show you an example. Michael. Sorry, Michael. Yeah, for, for like people in the um the housing constructions. You know, you pay housing over 25 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. They tend to use bonds because they get the repayment a little over a 25 year period. And as you explained earlier, people put this $1,000 bond and they're paid in 25 years. So they tend to match long term flow of money coming in with the long-term payment of money going out so right yeah in the indebtedness bonds is used basically in long term finance long -term, right yeah, yeah that's, that's a great analogy i was just going to suggest that we correlate the relationships the same way we do for individuals so the the yeah. company that is trying to raise money is just like the individual going in to get a bank loan right and then the the person who's in is giving them the money through buying the bond is is um is actually the bank technically Mm-hmm.
Okay. All right. Good, good discussion. Love the discussion so far. Um, so here, we're just going to talk about some of the things. Uh, I mean, there are many things you should consider before investing, uh, but these are some of the most important ones. Uh, so the first one is opening a brokerage account, right? Uh, so you need to understand what is a brokerage account and the types of account that exist. And we're going to go through uh, some of those. And the other thing that you want to understand is whether or not you're going to be going self-direct investing versus getting a broker, right? And you know you also want to decide your investment strategy, right? And so we're going to walk through each of these. And you also want to determine your, your how frequently do you plan, plan to monitor your investment. I know a lot of people say, you know, I'm a long-term investor, so I'm just going to put 10 grand in this stock and I won't look at it until 10 years. Well, that's not a good idea, right? So these are some of the things that you want to uh, look into um, before you decide to invest. And so let's walk through the first one, which is a uh, brokerage account. Anyone tell me what a brokerage account is? What's the, what's the difference between a brokerage account and a regular savings or checking account? Anybody know that one right off the top? Okay, so somebody has said, um, I guess the brokerage account allows you permission to issue trades. All right. So, so, like, so yeah, it, it, it gives you permission to, to buy or sell a, a, a financial instrument or a security, right? Meaning a stock. So uh, you can use a brokerage account to buy or sell a stock, right? Uh, so that's really um, the major difference between the regular uh, checking and saving. And obviously the, the, the brokerage account, uh, there's a lot more regulation uh, in place uh, for um, brokerage account. It's like I want that price. It, it, right? And it, it essentially holds the assets. So the same way your bank account holds your money, the brokerage account holds your assets, right? So that, and then all the management and, and manipulation of that is, is what determines how, you know, how well you do literally. But yeah. um, so the, the two things are very aligned in terms of concept. But as you said, there's more regulatory um, in, um, requirements. Uh, yeah, right. overseeing uh, of, right. of brokerage accounts. So I, I think just to clarify for, for people who may not be familiar with these terms, what's a broker? I guess before we get into the brokerage, what's a broker? So a broker is an is a, is a agent. It could be an individual or an organization that is licensed to um, buy or sell security, right? So and they, ma they uh, manage transactions. So if so, well, you'll often hear the term, um, I'm trying to broker a deal, right? So that, that's the management of, of a deal between two entities. So for, in this case, the investor and the company in the middle of that is a broker. So like a real estate broker, right? Is the person who's functioning in between the home buyer or the, home, the person interested in buying a home and the people who are actually selling the home. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the broker is that person in the middle. Right. right. And just for the Good analogy, analogy. For everybody, so in terms of uh, being a licensed broker, is there a license and unlicensed brokers? What do people have to be aware of? Well, yes, there, there are courses. There are courses that you take. Um, yeah. This, you know, uh, various ones. They've, uh, they've changed some of the acronyms since, since I was, quote, unquote, in the game. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, secur the, the securities course is one, one of the most popular ones, obviously. And yes, then it's right. delineated by the areas you want to focus on. Um, but yeah, that, when, you, when you graduate with a, in the States, they call it a finance degree. Up here, it would be a commerce degree. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can, if you want to become a broker, you take the, the CSC course or whatever it is. Yeah. And um, you can and, become a certified financial planner, and, CFP, et cetera, et cetera. But those right. are things, yeah. And IROC, um, IROC is, called, is the body that uh, regulates, um, you know, licensed uh, investors in Canada, right? So you can go to uh, the in Investment Industrial Regulatory Organization of Canada, and you will see um, brokers who are licensed, right? So they, you actually require a license to um, do certain, um, you know, buy or sell certain security on behalf of a client, right? And if you want to know who those people are who are licensed, you can go to um, the IROC website. And there's also information there about, um, you know, like the different types of financial instrument, where to go if you need a recourse, 
Uh, so a lot of useful information on this website uh, if you need more information, right? And you know, you know, before you decide to invest, I mean, a lot of people, what I, in my experience, a lot of people are going uh, uh, self-direct investing versus um, uh, getting a broker, right? And so yeah. self-direct investing um, really is literally you are doing it yourself. So once you set up this broker account, um, it's similar to logging into your regular bank account. You go to your um, your investment account instead, and you will just buy and sell um, stocks on your own, right? So that's really what self-direct investing is. It's also cheaper because um, you're because you're doing it yourself. So the bank is able to pass on those uh, cost savings to you. If they had to hire somebody to actually do it for you, uh, it would cost you more, right? So that's also one of the perks of doing self-direct investing. And when, we, when I actually go future, go in future slides, you'll see um, how to buy a stock, right? Um, We're gonna also look at a stock chart to see you know, what type of information that we, we should be looking for. Uh, so those are some of the things that, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. And like I said, it's gonna be like a, a whole new language. So feel free to interject and ask questions, right? So we're gonna go briefly through like, um, you know, the step to determine the account, right? So there are different types of accounts here. Um, so you wanna first determine the type of account that you want to use. Um, and the, the, you know, the, you can do a margin account, uh, you can do a tax-free savings account, you can do a RESP. Uh, so a margin account really, as the name suggests, is buying on the margin, meaning that, uh, so one of the, the benefits of a margin account is that it gives you full, um, the full privileges uh, to buy and sell security, right? So you can um, buy stocks in a particular company. So ABC company, you can buy individual stocks. You can buy ETF that we talked about earlier, but you can also do more advanced types of trade, such as options trading, right? We're not gonna get into options today, but on a high level, option is a form of derivative, which means it derives its value from something else. So if you're interested in options, uh, you can look into that, but we won't get into that discussion today. Another cool thing, and also a risky thing about a margin account, is that it has leverage, meaning you can borrow money to invest in stocks. So you can have a margin account and you wanna invest $50,000 and the, the bank will give you a loan through that account to buy security. That's a very risky decision. I don't, personally, I've never done it. Uh, so if, if that's something you're considering, I'd highly recommend that you speak to a professional, but that's another uh, feature of margin account. And then, Yep. I was just going to say briefly that, you know, in, in the diverse, the way you diversify within your residual income uh, and everything Andre is saying is exactly on point. You don't want to take funds that you need, let's say, to pay your mortgage and go into something right. like a margin, a margin account. What you want to do is you want to compartmentalize your savings and say, OK, I'm going to take 10 percent of my savings. And I'm going to go wild in terms of risk. And then right. you say, I'm going to take 20%. I'm going to be a little more moderate. And then my uh, the remaining 70%, I'm going to be a, you know, more conservative bonds, et cetera, et cetera. So diversify within your diversity of, of um, investments. And that's what a lot of people will do. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very effective way. So that 10% that is the stuff that you may have used to, you know, if you, if you let's say you, uh, you love sneakers and you, you say, every time I get, I'm getting a new pair of Jordans every paycheck and you have the income to do that, then you might say to yourself, okay, I'm going to move from buying Jordans because they don't have, I mean, although they appreciate in value, some depending on which series you get. But at the end of the day, if you take a small percentage of your savings and you allocate it to high risk investment, you're not right. going to miss that money, so to speak. So you're a little right. more risk averse. And then the more successful you are, the higher you might, um, the percentage you might want to take of your savings to right. um, invest in different things. But play yes. with it. It's, it's Definitely really a good point. And that, that, that's going to feed into uh, when we talk about investment strategy. Uh, yes. So what you described there is one of the strategies that I'll be talking about. So very good point there. And so the other account that I want to touch base on, uh, so we have a question here. What is your opinion on using robo-advisors with self-direct broker account like Questrade? I mean, um, most of the platform, uh, self-direct investing, it's all robo-advisors, right? Uh, so, you know, all the major banks, they have um, those robo-advisors. Uh, and you know, there's Questrade, there's Wealthsimple, um, if, and in the US there's, um, uh, I think it's a TD Ameritrade, there's Robinhood. Um, you know, they are all pretty good. Uh, I mean, obviously not all platforms are created equally, right? So uh, for me, in my personal experience, I use uh, TD, and my experience with TD is that 
TD provides a great overall experience, right? Because um, they have um, a lot of learning uh, opportunity. So they have um, webinars that they have like past recordings that I can look up individual concepts and, and, and learn those concepts. And you realize that once you start learning a particular concept, it brings you to something else. And it, you know, in that process, it allows you to expand your knowledge, right? So they are all pretty good. It, you just have to look for, yep, question. Um, and um, somebody just asked also, so for somebody who is inexperienced in the stock and the and investments, is it better to have a broker or is it better to just learn and, and do it like on one of these platforms like you're explaining right now? Learn. It's better to learn. Like you want to, even though you have a broker, right? You want to make sure that that broker is acting in your best interest. If you don't know what you're looking for, then you won't know if that individual is acting in your best interest. What I would recommend to start is actually using a stock simulator, right? So they have these online simulators. So for yeah. example, a lot of the banks have has um, a, a stock simulator as well as um, Investopedia. So if you literally go to Google and you, you type stock simulator, you'll see them pop up. And what a stock simulator is, so it allows you to buy actual stocks that are trading on the stock market, right? So it, for, when, for example, Investopedia, it will allocate 10,000 US, um, that's 10,000 fake US, and it gives you the option to buy security. So you can buy stocks in, a, in let's say, Google, and when the market opens, you'll see the price of Google going up and the, up or down. So that helps you with understanding how to buy the stock, and it also shows you the different price movement, right? And it also um, allows you to see whether or not you are making good choices. I mean, one of the things, the only, the only um, deficit in, the, in doing stock simulator is that you're just, I, I find that a lot of people, because I teach stock market and I see a lot of people buy stocks and they're just buying stocks. There's no fundamental work that goes behind it. So even though you're um, using the simulator and it's helping you to buy stocks, a lot of people don't do the fundamental work behind researching which companies to invest in, right? And when I talk about uh, fundamentals, I'm talking about what makes a business successful, what makes a business a business, right? So you wanna look at whether or not the company is profitable, does it have good management? Does this company have a competitive advantage? You know, is it a Tesla that has changed the auto industry? What is it that it's offering that makes it so unique, right? Is this something that can be used in the long term? So those are some of the fundamentals that you'd look for in a business, right? So if you're using the stock simulator, you want to look for some of those fundamentals um, as you are deciding which stock to buy. Absolutely. Right. And, and I think also to complement that experience and simulation is, is really, really ideal. But to complement that experience, you want to you want to read. Right. You, if you subscribe yeah. to particular newsletters, et cetera, et cetera, you'll get information that you can use effectively in your even in your simulated decision making. Right. Yeah. And then once you once that, you know, Rod and I always talk about, you know, you have that experience, you repeat it, it becomes a habit. The habit repeated 100%. becomes behavior. And then the behavior repeated becomes culture, which is similar to instinct. Right. You'll have a, a, a nice sense of instinct. So when a new company comes out, right, and with a new innovative sort of technology, you pay attention. How is the media reacting to this? How are the experts, the pundits, which are the people yeah. who are the experts in any particular category? Exactly. How are they reacting, reacting to it? How much are people talking about? Like Tesla was a great example, Andre. When Tesla first came about, they charged ahead with the whole autonomous driving notion. And people were like, what? I heard about self-driving cars. Do you mean there's actually a company doing it now? And then Tesla gets an initial wave of investment. But then also remember, so a lot of times, if you look at history and business, the Japanese culture, for instance, they took existing technology and they transistorized it. They made it smaller, more efficient, and more, more cost effective. And that's right. when Toyota and, and what was called Datsun back in Michael in my day, right? Datsun, and, which is now <laughs> Nissan, and those kind of companies, they, they, they took existing automotive technology, they, co they compacted it, made it cheaper, and then they penetrated other markets. And then they're, now you guys know, you all know, and Infinity and all those companies are all derivatives of those original companies. So the key is pay attention and read, 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 yeah. read, 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 and talk to people and join a little invest, start a little investment group with you and your close friends. Right. Yeah. So that, again, you're now taking the risk away and you're still getting all the reward in incremental amounts to, to try new things. And then eventually you could do stuff on your own. And next thing you know, your last name is Buffett. 
<laughs> not buffet, Rod. Rod, not buffet. Buffet, Rod, right. Rod buffet. Was buffet. I'm talking about buffet. <laughs> so I, I think this is a great segue before we get back to Andre in terms of curiosity. That is the fly word Absolutely. of what we're exploring. You've got to be curious to see what your potential is. And within yeah. the investment world, you've got to read, you've got to research, and this is an aspect of your curiosity. So just keep that in, uh, at, actually not at the back of your mind, at the top of your mind. Top. You've got Absolutely. to be curious of your potential and curious about not just your own potential as an individual, but your earning potential, mm -hmm. your investment potential. And we'll, we'll get a little bit further into that. And the learning never stops, uh, Roderick. I want to add that it never stops. Even for me presenting here today, I still learn every single day about new concepts in the investment world. Okay. All right, so I, I, I see some discussions here and question. Uh, so one of the question is, um, does the TD education, is it available to the public or only once you've invested? I think it's, one, it's once you create a broker account with them, you'll get access to the resources, right? Another question here is, what's the difference between stock, bonds, and a security? So the first thing is, um, so stock is um, an, what they consider that an equity uh, type of transaction, right? So a stock is you're buying a piece of the company, right? So when you buy a stock, you buy a small piece of that company. Whereas the, the, a bond is just like Michael said, it's a fancy term for a debt. It's like the company is borrowing um, the money from you, the investor, and they are going to pay you interest, right? And, and a security um, would be, a type of security would be a stock or a bond. So security is the types of instrument right? The type, the, the way that the institution choose to raise the money, right? So there are a few ways that a, a, a company can raise money. So one of those ways is, uh, you know, through the stock market. Um, another way is through the bond market, right? So through borrowing money from people. And either of those are considered a security, right? Let's put that out there. All um, right. Let's see. All right, we'll come back to some of those. Uh, and somebody made a point here about, um, be careful where you're getting information. Remember, the news can only report historical info. Um, so yes, uh, some news outlet report historical info, information. But as an investor, uh, when it comes on to investing, you know, you can go to the investor relations section of the company's website where they have to post that information ASAP, right? So once the information becomes available, it's listed on the investor relations uh, side of the website. And I'll also show you a few other platforms that will that gives you like almost real time uh, information. So, so Andre, I'm very happy that you mentioned that there is information that must be published in, in the financials because I know you haven't touched on it yet and you may do it at some time. Mm -hmm. But the, the whole concept of a company has a whole legal ramification around it. And there are things that companies must do. Yes. They must do. Um, and that kind of makes it a little better than you know, the partnership or the sole practitioner. Right. That's where all the right. broker comes in and who can do what and et cetera, et cetera. Because there's a whole law around having a corporation and the things they can and cannot right. do. Yes, good point. Uh, so, it's, yeah, it's not no if, but, or maybe. It's not a choice. They, there are things that they must do. And, uh, you know, there are requirements, for, uh, you know, from the corporate level, at the federal level. Uh, there's a, there are requirements if they follow... Uh, you know, IFRS, you know, so for a public company, you have to follow international financial reporting standard. Um, if it is that you're on the Toronto Stock Exchange, the exchange has requirements that those companies have to follow. So it's, it's pretty robust in terms of the requirements um, that they, these companies have to follow, right? Um, I the other one that I want to yeah. get back on information, Andre, about mm -hmm. where you get your information. Because as far as say, and, and, and Rob, you have to read and know where to read. Yeah. And one of the places to look. I think you're breaking up there, is, uh, Michael. On the financial reports. Was, yeah. I, was I breaking up just now? Yes, you were. Oh, sorry. All I'm saying is that in terms of where to look for factual information, because there's so much laws. Yeah, you're, you're breaking up there a little bit, uh, Michael. So yeah, I'll definitely I'll definitely touch on those. Um, they're they're toward the end of the presentation. The I'll, I'll walk through some of the you know, places where you can get that info. Yeah. All right, keep on going yeah. there. So I'll go in more detail. 
All right, so the other type of account here is a tax-free savings account. And I put Canada only here um, because, uh, you know, I know some, some people in the audience, they're probably from Jamaica and whatnot, uh, or from other Caribbean countries. So a tax-free savings account is just like the name says, right? It's tax-free. So once you earn money in this account, it's tax-free providing that you don't go over your contribution limit. And, you know, this year, um, the contribution room, I think is 6,000, right? So you can earn or contribute up to 6,000 per year tax-free, right? Um, and so, they, you know, a lot of people, when they think of TFSA or tax-free savings account, they think about just opening a TFSA account. But a lot of people didn't know that you can actually trade, you can buy or sell securities, you know, stocks or ETF through your TFSA account. Right, and you might ask a question, why should I choose a TFSA or why should I choose a margin? Which one is better, right? Well, it depends where you are in your financial journey. If it is that you're just starting out and you're just earning, I would recommend a TFSA because uh, if you invest, let's say $10,000 and that 10,000 becomes, let's say $50,000, you know, that $50,000 in additional earnings would be exempt from taxes because it would be in your, um, contribution bracket, if you've been in Canada since TFSA came out. I, I think it came out in 2009, I believe. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, if, you have, if, if you've been in Canada since the, uh, TFSA came out, you'd probably have about $70,000 in contribution room right now, right? So that's why I personally recommend the TFSA because it protects that earnings. Once you max out your TFSA, then you probably want to consider a different type of account such as margin account or RRSP, retired, which is Retirement Savings Plan. You know, there's also the RESP, which is Retirement Education Savings Plan. So there are a lot, a lot of different types of account that you can use to invest. Um, but the one that I recommend, I, I mean, it depends on your personal situation. If you're saving for a kid's education, then you'd probably want to consider RESP, right? Which is a Retirement Education Savings Plan. Um, but I leave those specific type of account for a separate discussion. This is just um, to highlight some of the accounts that are available. All right. And so the next step is once you determine the account, so you actually want to do some research on the broker. This is really important. So you need to ask yourself the question, what are my needs as an investor? So for me, I'll give you some example. When I was deciding which broker to use, some of the things that I consider uh, is reputation, right? I consider things such as customer service. If I wanted to call someone, are they available? Or will they respond in a timely manner? right? Is there um, facilities online for ad additional learning, right? What is the, 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 the cost, right? The commission. So every time you, are, you, you try to buy or sell a stock, there's a commission, right? So I factored in, um, you know, I looked at all the platforms to see who has the lowest rate, right? And so those are some of the things that you want to consider based on your personal need. I also looked at how long does it take me to get access to the cash? Once I invest and I make money, how quickly am I able to get this money? And some platforms, it takes longer, right? So those are some of the things that you want to consider based on your need. And then you're going to have to weigh those pros and cons, right? For example, the platform that I use right now, the commission is $9.99 per trade. So every time I buy and sell a stock, it costs me almost $20. But then when I weigh all the pros and the cons, the pros outweigh. So even though there are other platforms that are offering lower commission, I decided to go with this particular um, you know, platform that I'm using because I see way more uh, um, opportunities and, and flexibilities in this platform. Uh, so someone asked a question about the TFSA. What about if you came to Canada after 2009? So I think it's about a year. So you have, like, if, let's say you came in 2010. So at the end of 2010, if you came January 2010, by the end of uh, 2010, so you'll get, you'd start with $6,000, right? So depending, so let's say you came this year and, or last year, and last year was the first time you're in Canada. So your contribution rule would have been 6,000. So from whenever you came to the time you complete your first year, that's your contribution rule. So you wouldn't have the full privileges or the full um, contribution limit of the TFSA. All right. And so there are other platforms here. So for people in uh, Jamaica, there's a JN Money Manager, there's NCB, there's JMMB. So 
I mean, whichever country you are, it's a, it's a very similar process. You need to figure out the types of broker and the ones that you're going to go with. You want to do your research before you actually open a bro brokerage account. There's a lot of useful information online. Even if you go to Google and say, uh, which brokerage account should I choose? You'll find a lot of detailed charts that um, does like really good comparison. And it will walk you through the qualitative as well as the quantitative uh, factors that you should be considering. And last but not least, you want to fund the account, right? You need to put money in your brokerage account, right? So you have to figure out how frequently you're going to be putting uh, money in the account or whether or not the brokerage account itself requires you to start with a certain amount. I know some platform requires a minimum of $100 in the account, right? Some plat and whereas other platform, there's no minimum requirement. So you have to figure out if there's a minimum amount to put in and how to get money in the account. For example, my platform, I can easily transfer money from my checking account into my investment account. So it's pretty easy uh, in Canada that you can easily transfer money from one account to the other. If you're using an a, a independent um, account from your bank, so for example, if I uh, use TD and I decide to open a Quest Trade account, then you need to figure out what's the process. I think you can still do the e-transfer, but it might take about three or three or five business days for you to have access to the cash once you transfer it, right? So those are some of the things that you want to consider. And you know, this might seem, you know, five business days is um, seems like okay, so it's five days. As an investor, even five minutes can make a material difference. And when I mean material, I mean a significant difference for you, mm -hmm. right? So if you are more of a day trader, which means and we're going to talk about day trading later on, but if that's your strategy, five days to you is catastrophic, right? So you want to keep that in mind along with the investment strategy that you'll be working with. And there we go, right into the, the whole conversation of investment strategy. So Anyone familiar with the different types of investment strategy, just drop a strategy that you are aware of. Just a one word saying the strategy uh, in the, the chat. No reaction. Is everybody still airy? Like, am I losing the, the, the are, we, are we losing people? Okay, value investing, there you go. Yep, definitely. And this could be anything in terms of your investment strategies, what you've right. done in the past, what you've heard of. Exactly. Um, it doesn't know, have to be the textbook. There you go, buy and hold. So anything yep. that is um, in, in regard. It doesn't have to be the textbook textbook word. It can be, you know, whatever. So Amanda is still IRA. Anybody else IRA? And Amanda don't know any formal investment strategy, but she's IRA, which is good. As long as we have you IRA in the place, we love that. All right. I use buy and hold. So I see. So there's 10, 20, 40 rule. Um, who's, uh, Nadia, if you don't mind, can you come on and uh, tell us a bit about the 10, 20, 40 rule? I've never heard that one before. You've never heard, Andre? Huh? You've never heard about that one? <laughs> Nadia is going to come on if Nadia yeah, wants to share that a little bit. What's oh, that? it's about savings rather than investing. Okay, got you. All right. So, what are some of the things <laughs> that we have here, Andre? Huh? What are some All of right. the investment strategies that we have that you know of? All right. So, these are some of the, um, and, there, and there's more, um, but they, you know, there's value just like. Um, uh, someone said earlier, and it, it, we talked about uh, Warren Buffett earlier. So he's the type of investor that goes mostly for value investing, right? And value investing is really, you're looking for um, companies that are undervalued and you're buying them at the low price. It's similar to, um, you know, if you get up and you decide to go grocery shopping and you're, or, or clothes shopping, whatever it is, you're looking for brand name stuff that are underpriced. You're looking for those sales, those discounts. Right, and once you find those discounts, you're gonna go in the store and you're gonna buy them, right? And maybe you can resell them for a higher price. Who knows? So that's really the whole con the whole uh, notion of value investing is uh, looking for um, you know those undervalued stuff. And one of the good things is that I mean there are metrics that you can use such as price earnings ratio, but in 2020, you know everyone is all about making people life easier. 
And it's no different with investing. There's a fast way to know if something is undervalued or overvalued. And I'll show you. So let's look up a company here. Let's look up a Tesla, for example. All right. Actually, Tesla stock. And we're going to walk through this, this chart in a bit so that everybody fully understand what this chart is talking about. But if we go to um, Google and we just type in the name of the company and we put the word stock, uh, it will pop up this chart here. And then we can quickly go to um, the one that says Yahoo Finance. Right? If there's, so here, look for the link that says finance.yahoo.com. And it says stock price quote history news. Uh, once we click on that, it will give us more um, insight into the stock. There's a little value meter here below the company that tells you whether or not the stock is overvalued or undervalued, right? So it's telling us this stock is overvalued, right? And you know, you know, the reason why it's overvalued, so that you know, when they look at value in a stock, they tend to look at price earnings ratio, right? And in this case, we can see that you know, Tesla here is not profitable because they have negative earnings. So EPS here is earnings per share, right? And when we look at the price earnings ratio, one of the, um, the, 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 the factors that goes into calculating this is the EPS. And if it's negative, you're gonna see not applicable. So this is more on the technical side. Um, but my question is, since this stock is overvalued, does it mean it's a bad investment? Is it a bad investment because it's overvalued? <laughs> so Nadia says she's not gonna come on because Tesla is inflated. I know, I mean, um, no there, uh, you know, a lot of people are saying that about Tesla, that it's, uh, uh, it's overpriced. And, you know, a few people say, here are saying yes, no. Um, I wouldn't quickly say no, right? Because if you look at the other investment strategy here, so from a value investor perspective, if you're a value investor, you're going to say no. So if you're a Warren Buffett, you're probably going to say no, right, to Tesla. Maybe, maybe not. Um, because you're a value investor, but there's what we call growth investing, which is where these companies come in. And I'm going to walk you through a few companies that, in my opinion, I think are growth type stocks. And so growth is where you are trying to uh, match GDP and a growth in a particular sector or industry to the performance of the stock. Yep. So just uh, for people who, again, who don't know the acronyms, GDP, can you please explain what that means? Sure. So GDP is gross domestic uh, product. So it's the total, um, pro uh, uh, what would you say, the total um, output of a country, right? So for example, in Canada, it's the total output from all the sectors in Canada that goes into coming up with a, a number for GDP. And then you can look at individual sectors. So um, you might see, um, let's say, um, the marijuana industry, what you'll see is sometimes when you do like research, they might say, okay, the new the marijuana industry is expected to grow by 20% or bring in $20 billion. So you can use that if you're, you know, like if you're gonna invest in a particular company, you can say, okay, this sector is worth about 20% and it's expected to grow about 20% year after, year over year. So that could be um, your expected return that you're that you'd use, right? Um, cool? Yep, okay. I think people got that. All right. So and, and grow. So if we say, okay, I'm a value investor, I'm not going with that particular company, then you have to ask yourself, is my strategy growth? And growth meaning I'm investing in this company today and I'm expecting this stock to grow significantly over time. When you look at a lot of these growth stocks, for example, Shopify, right? Shopify is coming from what? It was in its 20s or 30s when they went public. And now it's currently trading at a, an alarming amount. Let's look at Shopify stock. Right, Shopify is really high. And I personally bought Shopify kind of late. I bought it when it was uh, 800. Uh, let's do Shopify TSX, Shopify stock, TSX. And I'll explain the TSX and uh, all that stuff. So Shopify right now is $1,402. So if you wanted to buy one share in Shopify, you'll need 1,402 Canadian dollars to buy one share in Shopify, right? If you had bought Shopify when the economy um, tank, well, when the COVID pandemic came out in March and all the countries start closing, uh, you'd have gotten Shopify at 372 per share, right? So that's what happened, 372 per share. So that means you'd have made $1,100 per share, 
So if you had bought 10 shares, that would have been over 10 grand between March and now. So that's the power of growth uh, stocks, right? So is that, sorry, oh boy, wrong thing. So it, that's, the, that's the power of um, buying, uh, investing in growth type companies. And another one here is, I mean, we're all familiar with Google, but the one that I want to bring to your attention here is Slack. Anyone familiar with Slack? All right, so someone says use it for work, yep. Right, so Slack, they provide um, a lot of work from home solutions, right? So for team-based working, for remote uh, type working. And the reason why I have Slack here is because we have seen the impact that COVID-19 had on um, you know, brick and mortar stores as well as um, traditional working environments. A lot of companies are either going to a fully work from home environment or they're gonna have some type of hybrid which means that they're gonna need a lot more work from home solutions, right? So some of the companies that are invested in this is uh, you know, Microsoft, there is uh, there's Slack and there's a few more out there, but this creates a, a huge growth potential for a company like Slack and the share price is reasonable. Again, you always wanna do your research and your due diligence to make sure that this company is something uh, that you wanna invest in, right? You know, this was from my own independent research. And Slack right now is at 33.84. When I first started monitoring this stock, it was trading at about $20 per share. So it's gone up significantly uh, since I started watching it. So before we even go any further, I actually want to walk you through what this chart means so that when we're looking at any more throughout the presentation that you fully understand. So when you go to Google and you look up a, a, any particular company's stock, you will see a chart that looks like this, right? At the top, it will tell you the name of the company right and right below here where it says nyse that's the exchange that it's listed on so nyse is abbreviation for new york stock exchange right if you're looking at a canadian a toronto based company you, you probably see tsx which is abbreviation for toronto stock exchange so this tells us the exchange uh after the colon here this uh abbreviation or, or what they call a symbol or ticker is a unique code assigned to that company on the stock exchange Right, so you know, work. Uh, so Slack Technology in the U.S., their ticker or symbol is work. So if I were to go and buy a stock, and I, when I pull up that stock chart and I type the word work, it will pull up Slack Technologies, which is the company. Right. Below the below the name of the the, the stock is the share price. So that's the market value of the stock, meaning the last price that it traded on, as of the previous. Um, B, right? So if I wanted to buy this stock, so let's say right now I want to buy this company's stock, I would pay $33.84 per stock, right? And this price is going to be different for different companies, as you see with um, uh, Shopify was $1,400, and this one is $33.84, and then the currency is listed beside it. So this one is an American uh, company, and it's listed in an American exchange, so the USD is short for United States dollar. Right? You'll see CAD for Canadian, or if you're looking at a British company, you'll see GBX, which is an abbreviation for the pound. Right? The, here is what um, this tells me the change in the share price um, for that trading day. Right? So the stock market in, in Canada opens at 9.30 a.m. and closes at 4 p.m. So that's considered one trading day. And within that day, um, well, this is the U.S. one, but it's similar to, can to Canada, but within that day, this price, the stock of the share, this price changed by 17 cents, right? Minus 17 cents. So the share price fell by 17 cents over the previous closing. So if we look right here, we can see the previous share price, which is $34.02. So the stock price fell by 17 cents, which is why it ended up closing at 33.84 over the previous closing. Anytime you see a red in the investment world, that's a, a signal that it's a, a declining, a stock is declining, right? So red is declining and green is increasing. Whenever you see the chart ends in red or the number here ends in red, it tells me that the share price closed lower than the previous, the previous day, right? So this was, uh, this was Friday's closing. So this was Thursday. So on Thursday, the share price closed at $34.02. But on Friday, it ended at 33.84, which is why this number is red 
and the chart is in red. If it closed higher, let's look at a, say we can find a higher example. Let's use uh, Amazon, for example. If it closed higher, the chart will be in green, right? So let's see, on Thursday, Amazon was 3,182, but it closed on Friday at 3,200, which is why the chart is green, all right? Um, another thing that I wanna highlight, so we have some reaction here. All right, some, some questions. Is there a minimum, maximum amount of stocks you have to buy? Uh, well, the minimum, stock, the minimum amount would be one. Uh, the maximum is based on what's a, what, if, what, what the amount of share that are available, um, that are outstanding, right? So if it is that uh, 10 shares are outstanding, then you can only buy 10. You can't buy more than what is outstanding, right? And the company will tell you um, like how many shares are available and outstanding, right? Another uh, question. When, when, you, when, you, when you buy stock, you, are, you also want to keep in mind about what makes sense. So a lot of times I'll see another question that usually comes after that question is what is the minimum amount I should buy, All right? So you actually, I mean, it goes back to your strategy. If you're in it for the long term and you're buying over a period of time, let's say you, you're going to buy, put in, you're going to invest $50 every month. Do I buy... Uh, do I buy um, $10 worth of stock every week or I wait until month end to buy? It probably made more sense to wait until the end of the month to buy so that you're not paying all that commission unnecessarily because every time you buy, you're going to pay comm commission. So you want to make sure that you're reducing your commission as you um, are buying those stocks, right? Okay. Another quick question. Where can you find the amount of holdings a company has? For example, uh, oops, I just moved on me. Sorry about that. Uh, for example, if I were looking to invest at Amazon, where can I find out how they have um, how they have in reserves or what they have in reserves before uh, investing? Financial statements. So you go to the investor section. So every company has an investor section on their website. So even if you if you Google, let's say um, let's say Amazon investor relations, right? So you can just put the name of the company and type investor relations. So every company must have an investor relation. Oh, I don't think this is Amazon. Every company must have an investor relation section. And so here you will find a lot of information regarding uh, financial statements, regarding about internal, regarding internal controls, about press releases, about um, the SEC, which is the Security Exchange Commission uh, filing. So all the information are regarding uh, the company you can find here, upcoming events, past information, all that information will be available on the investor relations section of the company's website. All right. So the other type of investment uh, in the interest of time that we want to talk about is, um, you know, momentum uh, investing or what, uh, when you go on a lot of these uh, platforms, you'll hear people talk about riding the wave, right? So this is a situation where you're looking for what's trending, really. And so in March, um, I was able to make good money um, because I bought and sold uh, pharmaceutical stocks. And pharmaceutical obviously was trending because of COVID-19. So whenever a, a company came out and announced that they, for example, got uh, first level FDA approval, their stock price went out the roof, right? So it went up pretty quickly. But you also have to keep in mind that those trending stocks, just as though they go up, they come down quickly as well. So before you uh, do the strategy, you also want to do some risk management. You have to decide how much profit you're, you're willing to take and how much of a loss you're, you're willing to take, right? For me, my loss was uh, uh, 10%. So I was willing to take a 10% loss and I was willing to take a minimum of 50% uh, profit. Um, and so for me, I was actively monitoring my stock. So I see the pattern that exists. And if, I, that, if that profit of 50% is not achievable, then I'd exit the stock before. So if you're in this momentum type investing, then you know, it's, you're gonna you have to determine how frequently you're gonna watch the stock, right? And the type of momentum, are you gonna follow it for one week, three days, right? So you have to figure out how long you plan to, to follow this particular stock. Uh, you know, when uh, Nicola came out, I don't know if anyone is familiar with Nicola, but they're literally um, the disruptors of the, uh, the trucking business. So Nikola Tesla is a great scientist 
And so Tesla got used the last name of Nikola Tesla to start Tesla. And then um, I think his name is Trevor Milton um, is using the first name uh, Nikola to disrupt the trucking business. So when Nikola first um, merged together with uh, Vector IQ, uh, their share price went up pretty rapidly. And I'll tell you this, I, I, I was able to see a return of $9,000 in two days because of that rapid movement in the stock price, right? So if you're a momentum type investor, you can ride that way for a period and make that profit and exist, but never get too greedy. If you're in it for the short term and you're riding the wave, take the profit and leave, right? And then the other strategy here is what they call uh, dollar cost averaging, which is what Farley was uh, referring to earlier. So, you know, you create a safe to invest strategy. So for example, you know, you wanna buy um, Google stocks, right? So you, you say, okay, I'm gonna buy one Google stock each month. So every month that you buy the stock because you're buying it at a, at a different share price, the, 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 the system will automatically average out the price. So take the two price and the, it averages it out, right? So if you bought one stock for a thousand, and another one for 1500 it will average the price to give you a new price, right? So that's considered dollar cost averaging. For me, I love to use a strategy in a decline, declining market. So I use it in conjunction with other strategies. So I may have bought in company ABC, for example. Um, I, actually, I'll give you my, a live example of my experience. You know, when I first invested in Air Canada, the share price was trading at uh, $22, I believe, per share. And within two days, the share price fell about 50%. And I use this strategy called dollar cost averaging and I bought Air Canada at different price points. Mm -hmm. So I bought it at the 50% dip um, and dip meaning the, the fell in, fall in price. And then I bought it again when it, when it fell below 70%. So I was able to bring my average price down from $22 to about, uh, I think it was about $14 per share. And so when that stock price went up to about $18, I made a big profit and exit, right? So you can use dollar cost averaging when the stock price is falling. I think the first reaction for most people when stock price is falling rapidly is to sell what they have, right? In the investment world, you can't be emotional. You have to think about strategies and ways, especially if it's a company that you believe in. So when you, if you've done your research and you're confident about this company, uh, then you, you probably don't wanna sell. You probably wanna use a strategy such as dollar cost averaging if you have the funds available. Okay. All right. And then the last one here that I'm going to talk about is day trading. So day trading is literally what the name says. You are buying and selling stocks the same day, right? So let's say I got up today um, and let's say I read the news before that um, a particular company is going to be launching a new service, right? And I bought that stock on the day of trade. All right. So I got up today. I bought the stock. I made a quick 50%, 100% or 500%. I'll tell you, I've seen stock gone up as high as 1,000%, right? And let's say you make your profit for that day, you sell that stock. It doesn't matter if it's going up, you never go back into that stock. If you go back into that stock, then it's not day trading. It will be more like a momentum type trade. So once you've made your profit or your loss, you exit. So if that's your strategy, then you know, like, you know, this is a risky strategy. It's short term, it's immediate, it's quick cash. If you know what you're doing, I can tell you with some degree of confidence that you're able to make um, a minimum of $500 per week if you know what you're doing from this strategy. I see people set their target higher as much as 10 grand per week, but this also depends on the amount of capital that you have. So the more money you have, the more profit you're gonna make. So I don't foresee you making 10 grand with a th if you're starting out with $1,000, all right? But what I will tell you, there are significant risks to day trading. So proceed with caution. All right. So with all that discussion, we've talked about what is a stock, what is a bond, what is ETF, what are the strategies? How do I actually buy a stock and why would I buy a stock? Right. Those are two of the most important questions that we have to answer uh, when we talk about stock. And, you know, I've answered the, the question about why buy a stock before. Uh, but I'll go over it again. So the first one is to have a say in the company. So if there are issues affecting the company, uh, you get to vote, right? So that's one of the first thing, and you get a small piece of the company. But keep in mind that if you buy the stocks of a company, you can't just walk in and dictate. So you can't just buy some Walmart share, and you're going to go and you're going to you go to Walmart in um, a particular community, and you're like, hey, I don't like that. Move that from the front. Um, I'm, a, I'm a shareholder. Put it at the back. 
<laughs> doesn't work like that. All right. And the other thing is, you, you know, you, there are two ways you can earn from buying a stock. So the first one, we've talked about dividend. Uh, if you want to know which company paid dividend, it will tell you on Google as well. Um, so for example, Enbridge, we're all familiar with Enbridge. I hope. Uh, if not, um, so Enbridge is a Canadian electricity company. So here it will tell you quickly. So right where it, says, it usually says dividend yield year. Uh, and that will tell you the percentage of dividend. So it, by looking at Enbridge right away, you can see that it's a pretty decent. It's 8.07%. You don't get that on a savings account. So right there, and, and then by putting $40.15 in one Enbridge stock, you could get 8% return on that investment. That's way higher than you'd get in a regular savings account over a 10-year period. I guarantee you that, right? And if the, if the company doesn't pay a dividend, then you'll see a hyphen here. And you know, don't keep in mind that a dividend, not paying dividend, is not a bad thing, because what some companies do, rather than paying out dividend, they take the profit and they reinvest it in the business for the business to grow and expand. And then you get your return in the form of a capital gains appreciation, right? Which is what companies like Tesla and Google, um, that's what they do, right? They they don't pay dividend, but you get that high capital gains here. You may have bought the stock for 100 and now the share price is, you know, like Amazon, it may be bought it for 100. Now the share price is 3,200, right? So capital gain. All right. And then the other, the, 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 the other thing about buying stocks is that we achieve some type of diversity in the streams of income, right? So you may have already have your full-time job or a side hustle. But, but by investing in the stock market, you're able to create another stream of income. So you're not only relying on one stream of income, right? So that's another um, cool thing about buying stocks is that you achieve some portfolio diversification. All right, so before we talk about um, how to buy a stock, I wanna talk about two concepts, but I'll illustrate them on the chart so that you fully understand, right? So there are two types of um, pricing or, or price type that you utilize when you're buying a stock. And one is called a market order. The other one is called a limit order. So a market order is where you trade the stock for whatever the going price. Whereas a limit price is you can name the price if this price becomes available. I'll show you what this means right now. So when you go into your uh, investment platform, you will see something that looks like this, right? It's, a, it's like a purchase order. And you're going to fill in this information with a stock. So let's say I did some research on uh, Enbridge and I wanted to buy Enbridge. I'll take either the name or the ticker right here, ENB, and then I'll go to my stock chart, right? So I'll go to my stock chart and where it says symbol or name, I would type ENB or I'll type the name of the company here. And then I'll click this um, little magnifying glass and it will pop up information about the stock, right? And once that information pops up, it will look something like this, right? So you'll see information on this side about the stock. So in this example, I search Air Canada, which is AC, and it gives me some information here about the stock. And I'll tell you what all of this means right now. So here, Air Canada, uh, the market price is uh, $15.66. Um, below that, you'll see what is considered a bid and an ask price. So just like they, we used in the analogies earlier, uh, if you're buying a house, you're going to be asking for a certain price, right? So here, that's what the investors are asking for. They're asking for $15.67. And then the bidders, so those people who are trying to buy, they're bidding for $15.67. So in this example, the, stock, the, the bid and the ask price is close to each other. But in some cases, it can be, you can have a huge difference in the bid and the ask price, right? If there is significant, if there's a significant gap between the bid and the ask price, it tells me as an investor, especially if I'm a short-term investor, that there is not, not enough liquidity in the stock market. Meaning if I, uh, there's not enough buyers and sellers in the market. So uh, if, or, or, or volume of shares. And the implication of that is that if you buy a stock that is not, does not have enough liquidity and you make a profit and you're ready to sell, you might have a difficult time matching yourself with a, with, a, with a seller or a buyer, right? So if there's a big gap in these numbers, so that's one of the things that it tells us. Another way that you can look whether or not there's enough liquidity is just by looking 
at the volume. They usually give you the volume number. So as at uh, May 29, the volume of shares trading for Air Canada was 3.3 million. So that's enough um, volume of shares traded. So it would have been easy to be matched with a buyer or a seller. All right. The other thing here, um, so once we've determined the company that we want to buy, so we want to determine the action. So in this case, we are buying. Uh, if you're selling, you'd select sell. So you'd select the action here, which is buy. Sorry. All right. And then you'd select the quantity. So the quantity is how many you want to buy. So if you go to Enbridge and you have $100 to invest, you're going to pay $9.99 for commission. That leaves you with $90. So you'd buy two Enbridge stock, right? So that would give you two Enbridge stock. And so you'd come back to the order form here and you'd put two, right? So that's the quantity, how many you're trying to buy. Now here is the, the tricky part. And a lot of people don't know this. Some people do. So where it says price type, right? So remember we talked earlier about a market price type and a limit. There are many others, but we're we are gonna stick to market and limit in this presentation. So remember market is where you're buying at whatever the going price. So let's say I decided that I wanted to buy Air Canada. Let's say uh, Air Canada was going for um, $13 here. Let's say the market price is 13, but there's a, somebody here asking for 15, 67. If you select market, then the robot advisor, the system will match you with this, might match you with this person who's charging a higher price than this market price here, right? So when you choose market, it's whatever, it's whomever you're matched with, doesn't matter the price. So when you choose market, you could potentially pay a higher than the bidding price or the, um, the current market price, right? So that's what market price does. Then, you know, but I guess the, the, the advantage to, uh, using a market order though is that it gives you quick access to and from the market. So if you're see if you're a day trader and you see a stock going up and you think it might be faster to get in at a market order, then you'll choose a market order because it gives you quick access to the market. As well, if you're trying to sell, it will give you the quick quick exit um, from the market, right? Because it's matching you quickly with um, an available buyer or seller. And then the other one is a limit order. So the limit, just like it says is you are setting your price. You are telling the robot system what price you want to pay. So if the market price is 13, but uh, they've asked, they're asking for 15, you know, you'll say to the, the, the system, I need to limit my price to 13 and you'd specify that price. Once you select limit, you'll see a little box that pops up right here that says, what is your limit price? And if your limit price is 13, you put 13 right there because that's the price you're willing to pay. Now the disadvantage to that is that um, your order will only get filled, meaning it's um, you know you, you're matched with a buyer or seller, if that price becomes available. If it doesn't become available, your order will stay in the order status until the end of trading, then it gets canceled. Right? And then the other thing that you want to do once you um, you've determined um, your 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 action, your quantity, and your price type is that you want to specify. How long do you want this, um, this transaction to last? So you put good till. So you could put good till day is one option, but good till day is the one trading day. So between 9.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. So if you put good till day, it means that that order will stay in the order status for that day until it's filled. Or you can specify a longer period of time. You can say good till 20 days. Yes, there. And so that would, uh, your order will stay in the order queue for 20 days until it matches with a buyer or seller at, at, for that particular price. You'll find that the, mark, the limit order is, along with the good till strategy is very helpful. So for example, let's say you're going on vacation and you want to buy this particular stock, but you don't want to be monitoring the stock market while you're on vacation. So you can let the order, the system know that, okay, I want to buy company ABC for $5. I think while I'm on vacation, this price is going to fall to $5. So you would put the good till period for the duration of your vacation or longer, and then you'd put limit for $5, right? And the same thing on the selling side. So let's say while you're on vacation, you think the stock price is gonna go up 20 or 30% in value. You can put an action to sell, right? For a limit price. So you you'd want the stock to sell at $20 per share, nothing less, nothing more. And it's good for this particular period of time, right? And so that will eliminate your, your need to be constantly checking the stock price while you're busy, uh, maybe doing work or, or on vacation. Any question regarding um, 
buying or selling stuff. And just a reminder, please put your phones on mute if you're not asking a question at this particular time. Thank you very much. All right. Here's one of the tools that I love a lot. It's called a watch list, right? So as the name suggests, it's a watch list. They're literally watching it. I mean, I would have showed in my, my, in my investor platform what my watch list look like, um, but I'd have to walk through too much of my personal info. So I'll, I'll show you a watch list on Yahoo, all right? You can create a watch list on Yahoo Finance. So if you go to Yahoo Finance, all right? Um, one second, I'm just gonna mute somebody here. Okay, is my screen still, uh, you can see my screen? Yep, I can see your screen. Okay. All right. And we'd literally come over here. Uh, so in the top right hand corner here, you can create your portfolio. So I've added, I've added these three stocks to my portfolio. And so what the watch list does, it tells us, it shows us the movement of the price. So let's say I want to buy Amazon, but I don't want to buy that 3,200. I'll put it on my watch list and I'll watch the price move. Once it hits the price point that I want, uh, I would go in on Amazon. The other thing that I personally use watch list for is for those um, short term or momentum trade. So I have a few stocks, for example, this company, and please don't interpret this stock the wrong way. Every time I write this stock, people read it wrong. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I've been watching this stock for a while and I know that this price point here is a good buy because this stock tend to randomly goes up in value. By, but this stock, I take significant risk here um, because you know I don't really know much about the company and the fundamentals, but I've been watching it for a while and I see the price shoot up in value. Anytime it hits 58 cents, anything below 62 cents, uh, the share price tend to go up like 20, 30% within one day, right? So this uh, share price here creates a buying opportunity for me right now. So that's another powerful thing about the watch list is that you literally watch stock because you have to keep in mind that there are people behind these trades and we can almost predict how people are behaving because once people st start to see that pattern in that price movement, they're going to be thinking the same as oh, I am thinking, okay, this is a good buying point, right? Or you can use charts if you want, if you're more, if you're good at a uh, technical analysis and you're good at using charts, you can use charts to predict those buy and sell points. Uh, but we're not getting into charts today because it's, um, it's quite technical. Oh, really and truly, the watch list, again, like it's powerful. Um, another thing that you can set up is alert. So for example, I set up alert on my phone. So when, once American airline or Delta airline falls below 10%, I get an alert saying, you know, this stock falls below 10%. And I look at that stock as to whether and decide whether or not I want to buy. So you can set those alerts as well. And it can work for both um, increase or decrease in stock price or whenever there is a uh, material news. Um, on that company. All right, so earlier we talked about uh, getting news about the company and information to make decisions. So here I've compiled a list of um, some of the places that you can get information. Uh, the most reliable source, and if you want to break it down based on reliable and not so reliable, the most reliable source is from the actual company itself, right? There's nowhere else to get the, the, the most accurate information other than uh, the company themselves unless the companies are committing fraud, right? But you could go to the company investor relations section and you can get information about um, you know, the financials of the company. Uh, you can get information about forward-looking events. And forward-looking events meaning um, you know, the company might be thinking about la launching a new service or a new product. And th that would be disclosed uh, in the financial statement. You, know, you can look in um, the business to gain more insight into whether or not they, they have segments, right? Uh, is this company uh, philanthropic? Does it ties into my personal values, right? So those are um, some of the information that you can get on the company's website. If there's a material event, any material event, even in some cases, information that's not material, and by material, I mean significant to change the value, right? Even if it's not material, there are some information that must be disclosed on the company's uh, investor relations section. So I would start there in terms of my research. Another place where I like to look is Globe News. So Globe News is a website that gives you real-time information or as real-time as possible. So you can go to Globe News and you can literally put in a, a specification about the type of information that you want and you'll search, you know, earnings. Some people are what they call earnings chasers. So they wait for um, companies' earnings to be released and then they buy the stock. 
uh, the market usually reacts to earnings uh, information. So, you know, if there's like a significant increase in earnings, the share price might go up, right? Or if there's a significant decrease, it might go, go down, but that's not always true. Another place where you can get good information as well is like Yahoo, Google, uh, there's StockTwits, uh, which is, uh, StockTwits is kind of like a, an, a, a, the Facebook of stock. So you actually have people having live discussions about what's going on in the market. And I'll show you um, what StockTwits look like uh, here in the presentation. And I actually want to touch on two concepts that, that if you decide to use um, stock, tweets, stock tweets, you'll know what they mean. So at the top here, you'll see um, the green bar mean bullish, sorry, saying bullish, and the red bar is saying bearish. If you remember earlier in the investment world, we said that red is uh, synonymous to a decline in price and green is an increase in the price, right? So if you think about a bear, you want to think about a bear in the sense of hibernating, meaning it's going down. Right, so once they say that the stock market is bearish, it means that it's decreasing. So that's what the concept bearish means in investing. If the stock market is bullish, if you actually look at a raging bull going up, actually one of my students used that analogy in my stock market class. So the bullish is actually going up. So if they say that the stock market is bullish, bullish means that it's gonna go up in value or if a particular stock is bullish. <clears throat> so if you go on stock to it, you might see a particular chatter here, for example, this person name is Gold, uh, some, that, this best or something. He's saying that this stock is bullish. And this is the, the stock here, you see the stock code. If you hover over the stock, you'll see the name of the company. I, I want with a great deal of caution, do not rely heavily on this platform to make your decision. You have a lot of stock market manipulators out there that are trying to boost up things to get you to buy into it and carry that bag. So this use this as informational purposes or a way, a way to find additional information about a stock or a particular company, and then you go do your research. Don't quickly act based on what you see here alone, all right? I just wanna put that out there. And then there's investor observer. So I like investor observer as, as well as um, uh, market watch. And then there's um, investopedia. So every morning before the stock market opens about 8.30 a.m., they send me a newsletter telling me the outlook based on, on the markets, right? So I might get a, a newsletter saying the market is going to be bearish or uh, this is what is happening in Europe. So this is expected to happen here in North America. So I, I subscribe to um, a few of these uh, platforms, Investor Observer, Market Watch, as well as Investopedia, because I want to keep in the loop. Remember Michael said earlier, a big part of investing is keeping up to date. And I like to keep up to date. So I follow a lot of these platforms. Uh, to get um, information before the market opens. I see a few people talking in the, uh, the chat about uh, platforms such as TradingView. So these are some of the platforms uh, that you can get information about um, particular stocks and you'll see companies that are performing well, companies that are not performing well. Uh, one of the things that you want to keep in mind about some of these platforms, even on Google, is that the information is not real time and I'll show you what I mean. I think someone alluded to that earlier. So if I were to go to Google and let's uh, go back to my um, Enbridge stock. What you'll find and pay attention when you're buying a stock, what you'll find if you were to look at Google is that let's say it's 9.30 a.m. at the beginning of trade, or let's say it's 10 o'clock. The information on Google might be as of 9.30, meaning that it is not at 10 o'clock. So you might see this price, but it's not the current price, right? To get the current price, you can do one of two things. You can either um, go into the platform and put in the information as if you were going to buy the stock and to your right, it will show you the real time price of the stock. That's one way. Or for me, for example, for me, I use um, a platform within TD uh, called TD Advanced Dashboard and it gives me real time. Or you can just go to if you're um, in any of the banks or downtown or wherever you see these big screen and you see those numbers going up and down in green and red. So that is what that is uh, provided real-time investment information. All right. That's a lot of information today um, in terms of the investor world. So the last thing that I want to touch on here briefly is uh, some of the factors that can affect share price or the stock market in general, right? So economic factors such as recession, boom, or bust. So for example, in Alberta, Alberta has a boom or bust economy, right? Because it's dependent on oil. So when oil is booming, 
you know, you know, everything is performing well and things might, you have more economic activity, so prices might go up. And when there's a bust, you know, price goes down. So those, so those are, you have to pay attention to that. Recession, when a company or, sorry, when a country declares a recession, that will ultimately affect the share price. You might see a, a, a big drop in share price. You know, for example, when um, the 2008 recession came, the stock price, uh, they plummeted. Nonetheless, the share price will recover, right? Especially if it's um, a pretty solid company um, that has uh, a lot of cash on hand and good balance sheets. You want to pay attention to the balance sheet to make sure that the company can cover its short-term and long-term obligations, right? And by obligation, I mean debt, money that they borrow. Um, other things, so we see that outbreaks, so I put outbreaks here, outbreaks and pandemics can have a huge impact, right? And COVID-19 shows that the world literally stopped when COVID-19 came and it didn't only affect one or two industries, it affected global economies, right? So we, 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 we've witnessed this firsthand. But what I want to highlight um, is that, you know, even though these things are, are happening and share prices are, are falling, you have to put on your investor hat. And you have to say, as the consumer, you are probably running away from the stock market, but as an investor, you are seeing buying opportunities, right? Think of it as good value companies dropping in price, right? So that just creates a buying opportunity when share price uh, is low. And we've talked about this quote previously, buy the rumor and sell the news, right? So you wanna, when you have those rumor and the share price fall, that's a good time to get in, if it's, especially if it's a really good company. And then when that big news comes, and people are jumping on board, that's when you hop off and you take that big profit. All right, so any questions? I know it was a lot of information. Um, lots of any questions? Today. Um, lots of things to think about. And um, uh, again, in terms of the theme of the day from the fly perspective is curiosity. We have to be open to ask questions. You know, the way that we learn is um, through asking questions and, and our curiosity, and, and especially as a, a community that has um, undergone so much, um, sometimes our curiosity has been stifled, right? And if you think about us as, as, as youth or children, you know, we were often so curious about, you know, what does this do? What does that do? You know, we gotta ask these questions. We gotta continue to ask what, where, why, when, how. And, um, you know, the more we ask, the more that we learn. And, and in terms of asking the experts, and in this, in this um, format, obviously, we're asking the experts. We have, obviously, Andre with us today. We have Michael with us. Ask the experts. And if there's something that you didn't get from today, or if there's something that you need clarified, please send us that email um, to the BBPA, and we will definitely get back to you uh, within a, a timely manner to explain exactly uh, what you need to have clarified. So without further ado, is there any specific questions that people wanted to ask today um, based on what we've learned from Andre? And if you could come on um, and instead of going on the chat, just for the last uh, Q&A piece, if you could come on and just ask those questions again, let your curiosity lead the way. Everything in this life that we know has been uh, born out of curiosity. Yeah. And you know, we can embellish what we already know, we can augment what we know, but it still takes that curious um, nature that extra step. So please you know, open up your minds, open up your spirits, open up your, your hearts, Be curious about our ultimate potential. Do we have a, do we have a question? All right, do we have a question? I got a quick question. I don't yep. know if you guys can hear me. Yes, yep, we can. can hear. All brain. right, I po I posted it in the group in regards to um, what other real time platforms we can use. So as you mentioned, you're with TD, and TD has its own version of real time, but you have to log in to, log into, into your account, account. account. Right. Right. What I'm saying is that if you don't want to log into your account, um, is there another whether it's free or you have to purchase it? Is there like another um, real time platform that you can look at? So if you Google the stock and the stock is not giving you a real and it's not giving you a real time um, value of that stock, is there like another platform? I mean, you, uh, you can probably obtain information from the, the stock exchange website, right? So Toronto Stock Exchange. Okay. Uh, so yeah, like they'll have the, mar the market information streaming across 
Um, they may not have everything, um, uh, but it, you'll definitely get um, the major indices and a few of the, um, the major companies. Uh, um, I mean, if you're, I know like on certain dashboards or whatnot, you can get it, but I think the major stock exchanges, they usually have the real, real time information streaming across um, their website. So that's probably uh, the best place if you don't want to go to a platform. I know a lot of the other platforms like TradingView and et cetera, uh, you probably have to have some type of account, um, like paid account to be able to get that, that real time information. Um, but my recommendation would be the stock exchange, go to the stock exchange. Okay, thanks. I forgot that I turned off my mic. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions that we have? You know, thank you very much for uh, staying with us for the actually two hours today. And you know, the, the conversation has been very engaging. And um, you know, we I have a question. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. I have a question. It's not regarding uh, today's session, but I would like to do budget. But I don't know what tools to use. Do I have suggestion, please? In terms, you want to do a budget? Yeah. Okay. So I mean, some of the uh, the, the banks they have like a budgeting tool. So the one that we used in the example last week it was the the T TD cash flow calculator. So uh, if you go to Google and um, search TD cash flow calculator you will see an, an example of a budget. Or you can just um, Google like budget templates or budget softwares and you'll get some example um, that comes up. And that's actually something that the BBPA is going to be providing um, in terms of uh, the members, um, how to prepare a budget and actually having templates. So stay tuned for that. And if you're not a member as of yet, please, please, <laughs> please join the BBPA. Join us at bbpa.org and become a member today. And yeah, I was just about to say to Andre that that is a program that we are delivering as we speak. If people need specific help, mm -hmm. they can call into the BBPA and we'll give them one on one. Right? Or you can again just join at bbpa.org, become a member, and these are some of the benefits of membership that you will get with the BBPA. And just while we're plugging BBPA, if anybody has um, a young person or, and it actually doesn't necessarily have to be a young person, if anybody knows of somebody or, or yourself are going to post-secondary education, uh, the BBPA scholarships, the deadline is July 15th. So please uh, go online. Um, get information, apply for a scholarship, and you know we have um, several uh, donors this year that has made the scholarship pool very robust. So you know we're here to help you in the community. So please, please, please go to bbpa.org and become a member and also apply to the scholarships. And incidentally, Rob, it's not just academic scholarships we're looking at this year. You're looking at vocational scholarships. We want to learn to drive a truck or something like that. Absolutely. Mm. Everything in the book, as long as it's post-secondary, actually, it's not necessarily post-secondary, as yeah. long as it's moving you forward in terms of your, your education and your, um, your ability, we are here to back you at the VBPA. All right. On that note, any last words, Andre? Um, I mean, as, as I discussed earlier, you know, like just open your mind and, you know, keep learning. Uh, like we're in this together and, you know, please stay in touch with BBPA. Lots of great information and resources available. Uh, utilize these resources. Um, don't leave today feeling overwhelmed and feeling alone. We're actually here to help, right? And we want to see you grow in your investment journey and your, your savings journey and to have additional streams of income, right? To diversify your portfolio and start building for the long term. So don't feel alone. We are here. BBPA is here to help you. Uh, so feel free to reach out to the BBPA if you have any questions or if you need any clarification on any of the topics that we've talked about. Okay. Yeah. Now, hi, everyone. And I just wanted to say one last thing. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I listened to the entire session. It was just exceptional. I want to know that the videos are available. Can you hear me? Yes, the videos are available online. 
at um, someone had put the link in in the chat and then today's video will also be available by Monday as well. Thanks everybody. Thank you from our president Nadine Spencer at the BBVA. I know uh, with any last comments. Uh, Any last comments, Andre? No, right. nothing more. I mean, let's. I mean, we look forward to seeing everyone next week again. So it's continued a great discussion. <laughs> so uh, please remember to bring a friend, bring anyone, right? Because we want the information to be passed on to as many people as possible, right? Don't you know one of one of my favorite quotes, like growing up, is any knowledge passed and is not passed on is no knowledge at all. So if you were to find the cure for HIV today and you don't share it with anyone and you die tomorrow, then the cure die with you. It dies with you, right? So please allow other people to learn. Let's share the information within the community and uh, continue to build the community, right? Absolutely. Thank you very much to everybody who joined us today. We appreciate you. We value you. And as Andre said, bring a friend, tell a friend. Next week, we'll be here, same time, same place. And we look forward to having you back with us. And again, the word of the day from the fly perspective is curiosity. You know, dream, continue to, to look and inquire within self and within this world that we live. And um, our curiosity will lead us onto a path of, of greatness and majestic um, entitlement. So without further ado. Hold on, I actually want to shout out to Cam. So Cam brought two friends, that's great. Thanks Cam for bringing two friends. Hopefully we're getting more of these um, in the future. Absolutely. And thank you very much to our Nova Scotian partners today. We saw some people on from Nova Scotia, from down home. Thank you, bring everybody from Halifax, North Preston, um, Lincolnville, everywhere that these, there's black communities in um, Nova Scotia and everywhere from Nova Scotia to Vancouver, join us on the BBPA platform for Flip, Floss and Fly every Saturday, 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. My name is Roderick Burton. And as we always do on our way out, we're gonna bring some musical pleasure to you and yours. All right, black is beautiful. Andre, have a safe uh, trip in Jamaica, and we'll see you Thank back you. here next Saturday. All righty. Sounds All right. good. Thank you.